So this discussion is about childhood communicable diseases. Um, the best place to reference this information is in your ATI book, in both the PN book and the ADN book. Um, chapter 34 is on immunizations, and chapter 35 is on communicable disease. So I highly recommend you review those chapters. That will help you with this information. Um, the first part I'm going to talk about is a review. Um, either you've talked about it in fundamentals, or a med surge, or in very different places when you've talked about immunity and infection um, precautions and all this stuff. Um, but this is just a quick brief review and some additional information specific to pediatrics. But make sure you review chapter 34 and 35 in your ATI book, because I'm not going to talk about those specific communicable diseases, but I would recommend you definitely know those. So the first thing we have to look at about, about related to infections is factors that increase the risk of infection. So we have virulence of an infection, which virulent, virulence just means how susceptible that host is, things about that host that makes them easier to get that infection. So things like age, you're very young and you're very old, for instance, are more um, easily able to get infections. Genetics can play a part. Nutritional status, if they are malnourished, they are more at risk of getting infections because their immune system is not going to work. So all these things come together to determine the virulence, how likely it is that that infection or that um, bacteria or virus or whatever it is could cause an infection. Um, so some other factors also play into this, things like our normal flora, like for instance, when you take antibiotics and you diminish that normal flora you normally have, it can cause problems with getting secondary infections, like yeast infections, for instance. The pH of our body fluids, uh, most areas that are, in fact, all areas that are exposed to the outside, think your, your vagina, your urethra, your stomach, all those things have a pH to it, and part of that is to create a little bit of an acidic environment to prevent bacterial growth. Um, and then those portals of entry and portals of exit, um, that's going to increase virulence. For instance, all of us, like I've said, have staph living on our body uh, at all times on our skin, which is fine, but then when you get a portal of entry where you get a cut in that skin, then that bacteria is able to get into a place it's not supposed to be, and that increases that virulence when it has a portal of entry to go into. So let's talk about types of immunity. Um, this is a review. Um, there are four types of immunity. Um, the two big categories, you have your active immunity and you have your passive immunity. And then under each one, you have a natural form and an artificial form. So active immunity is one your body actually has to work to get. You are exposed to something and your body creates those antibodies against it itself. It has to work for it. So because your body has to actually work for it, it's going to last longer and it's going to be more protective. So when we're talking about a natural form, that's when you actually get sick, when you get the flu, when you get a cold, when you get um, chicken pox, for instance. All, that's that natural form in the environment um, and it causes you to create those antibodies against it. The artificial form is like your vaccines or your toxoids, those kind of things where the actual source of it was created in a lab or altered in a lab, so that makes it artificial, but it's still going to have that same immune response. You still have to respond to it with your own body. The passive types of immunity is where the, the immunity is just handed to you. Like a great natural form is maternal antibodies, either through being a fetus in the womb or breastfeeding is an excellent example as well. Those antibodies are passed on. They're natural. They occur in the environment naturally, but they are not ones that baby creates or reacts to. They are given to them, so they don't last very long. That's why babies only have that innate immunity from their mom for about three months if they're not breastfeeding. Um, then you have your artificial, again, something that was created or altered in a lab, and that's your immune globulin. Um, those immune, those pre-created immune substances that are given by intravenous route, you'll hear it called IVIG, um, and those are just passed along. They help fight whatever's going on when we talked about like tetanus, for instance, and botulism. We talked about the, one of the treatments is they get that immune globulin or that IVIG. So it's just an extra boost to their system, but they don't actually create it or use it. It just helps fight that infection. So some types of immunization agents, um, we, we always think of 
vaccines. When we think of immunizations and vaccines, they're often used interchangeably. But there are other things as well. Our toxoids, for instance, um, we can give specifically related not to the bat the protein from the bacteria or virus that we're trying to fight, but the toxin it produces. Um, Antivenoms are another example. That's where you're given um, to fight snake bites and other types of bites. Um, so these are different types. You have your immune globulin antitoxins. Um, your vaccines, your toxoids are active. They are just a protein or some derivative like a toxin that your body has to respond to versus the immune globulin. Your body doesn't actually respond to it. It's just given to you to like an extra boost. So I know you've seen this picture before. Again, you're going to need to know your immunizations. Hopefully you know them already because they were on the first test. But if you don't, make sure you review those. You're going to need to know that, that schedule of antibiotics as well as um, kind of what the purposes are. And on Blackboard under the first week of pediatric content, there is a um, very detailed sheet that goes through some of those things regarding that immunization schedule as well as the purposes of those immunizations. Um, as far as storage of immunizations, that becomes important. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, all immunizations are kept either refrigerated or frozen. Usually your dead vaccines are the ones that are just your proteins are refrigerated and they come in a liquid form. So you just draw them directly out of the vial. Your live vaccines, like your MMR, your hepatitis A, and your varicella are kept frozen until they're ready to use. And they're just in a powder form where you have to reconstitute them. So once they thaw out, if you don't have it reconstituted and given it, if they thaw out, they are trashed. You can't use them anymore once they thaw out. So it's very important to maintain that temperature. When I worked at Bonaire, um, we had to check the refrigerator and freezer temps twice a day and document those and show if they were not within a very strict temperature, then we had to show means of correcting that. Um, some other things to make sure you're maintaining appropriate temperatures, not keeping them in the door, because every time that door gets open, even if it just changes the temperature a couple degrees, even if it's briefly, that can alter the effectiveness of that vaccine, as well as making sure that you're, you're not having them up against the walls of the refrigerator, because the temperature is not as cool there. The center is the best place to put that. So transmission of infection, this is a review again from Fundamentals talking about how infection is transmitted. Um, I know you've heard about the chain of infection and that's what this picture shows here. In order for a infection to happen, all six portions of that chain must occur. So you must actually have an agent, kind of like the old wives tale that you can get pneumonia from wet hair. Um, not true. Pneumonia cannot be caused by wet hair. You have to have an infectious agent to actually get sick. And then you have a reservoir, something that it gets carried in, whether it be contact, whether it be um, in a mosquito, like a vector, all those different things. Then you have to have a portal of exit, something, some way it gets out of that person or when we're talking about like mosquitoes away it gets out of those mosquitoes um, so that portal of exit when you sneeze for instance that's a portal of exit that's why you should cover your nose um, then you have to have a mode of transmission whether it be that it gets transmitted in those droplets or if you touch something and you have to have a portal of entry so if you for instance get bacteria on your skin but there's no opening in that skin you have eliminated that portal of entry. That infection can't happen. And then on top of that, you have to have that susceptible host. And that's where that, um, going back to if the virulence of the infection, if those factors are there to make that person a um, susceptible host. For instance, those of us that have well-working immune systems, for the most part, are not going to get tuberculosis. Somebody that does have a problem with their immune system, like patients with HIV, chemotherapy, whatever it be, they're more likely to get that infection. They're more of a susceptible host. So when we're preventing the spread of infection, let's talk briefly about the different types of precautions. You should know these by now. You should be well informed about these, um, but we'll review them. Standard precautions is what we use on everybody. Everybody. 
every patient. Basically, the best way, and you, you can never use it too much. The, the very basic amount you should be using this is when you're touching any kind of mucous membranes. So the mouth, the nose, the genital areas, um, those kind of things. Open skin or if you're going to come in contact with any body fluids, you should be using standard precautions. The easiest way to think about this is if it's wet and it's not yours, you need to cover yourself. So your standard precautions do involve appropriate hand hygiene as well as PPE, and that PPE is going to be based on the situation. For instance, if you are um, doing a wound dressing, if you're just changing the dressing, gloves is probably sufficient. However, if you're actually irrigating that wound, you're probably going to want to wear some goggles and a face mask because of the potential of spray from that. So it's going to depend on the situation, how much PPE you're wearing in that situation. So understanding hand hygiene, make sure you're using the correct hand hygiene. You know, most things we can use our alcohol-based hand sanitizers for, but unfortunately, things that produce spores like C. diff, that's not going to do any good. So making sure you're using the appropriate hand hygiene. And if your hands are soiled, you also can't use alcohol-based sanitizers because... That poop that's on your hands, it may be sanitized, but it's still there. So you have to wash your hands with exposures to those things. Other things that goes with this just general infection control, not wearing artificial nails. Y'all know this, that studies multiple have shown no matter, you cannot scrub artificial nails enough and get all the bacteria out. They're actually seeing that with nail polish as well. More and more places are going to absolutely no nail polish, especially when you're in certain areas, because even if it's not chipped, it can get under the edge and it's shown that you can still um, transmit that infection. Um, Anybody who has open lesions, like if you're a caregiver, these need to be covered because that's a portal of exit that could get in contact with a portal of entry on your patients. Um, so soap and running water is the best way. It can be used in any situation, but in other certain situations, you can also use your hand sanitizers. Then we have our transmission-based precautions, and these are going to be based on the specific organism that we're talking about or the method of transmission. So the, we're going to talk about four of them. Three of them are the ones specific to certain um, invaders. So the first one is your airborne infection precautions. This is your most extreme form. Um, the easiest way to remember which ones are used with airborne is MTV, like the television um, station. So this is your measles, your tuberculosis, and your varicella. All of those require airborne isolation. Um, and if in doubt, your priority, even if you suspect an infection, even if you don't know for sure, put them on isolation. It is better to isolate them and be able to take them off than to not put them on isolation and found out, find out later you created this um, situation where things could have been spread. So a lot of times when patients come in the hospital, especially during heavy RSV season, as soon as they get there, because it may take a few hours for that test to come back, definitively saying if they have RSV or not. So as soon as they're admitted, we put them on those precautions. And then if it's negative, we can take them off, but better to be on the safe side. Um, so these are, when you're talking about airborne, are very small particles. So when we talk about large particles and small particles as far as your, that are transmitted in respiratory droplets, your large, your small particles are just by breathing. It is transmitted on just that fluid that you're breathing out. So that's why you have to wear the fitted mask, the N95 mask. You'll see or hear it often called a duckbill mask because of that first picture you see on the left-hand side, the older style. Um, and you're seeing those go away some, but they're still definitely around. It looks kind of like a duck bill. The one in the middle is another type. It looks more like that traditional mask, but it's more fitted to the face. Um, the third picture is an example of a negative pressure room. So a lot of times these rooms are going to have some kind of alcove or area in between an ante room where the two doors are shut on the each side. You, you go through that ante room so you're not transmitting that air and the air actually gets sucked out of the room that the patient's in through negative pressure to um, a ventilation system. So it's not getting out into the general ventilation system. If you're transporting these patients, you just need to put a regular mask on them 
and um, you take your own mask off. Usually patients on airborne precautions, they don't go anywhere unless they absolutely have to. Um, they're going to find ways to keep them in the room. But if you have to, then you would put a mask on them to transport them out of that room. So then we have contact precautions. That's what most of us think of. We use a lot of things for contact precautions. Um, this is usually related to skin to skin or skin to mucous membrane or something like that type of contact. So most of the situations you use contact precautions for are going to be contact situations. Um, so skin infections are often going to be contact precautions. GI infections, like your diarrheal infections and all, are often going to be your contact. There's one respiratory that's an exception. Most of your respiratory infections, except for tuberculosis, are going to fall under those droplet precautions, but the one exception is RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, that we've talked about. That one is actually a contact precaution, not a droplet. So the general rule of thumb with contact precautions is if you're going to be within three feet of a contaminated patient or contaminated area, then you should have your PPE on appropriately. Um, and this is why when you walk into a patient's room that's on contact precautions, you're expected to put that on at the door because any part of that room could be a contaminated area. So it's not just the contaminated person, but anything that could be part of their contaminated area as well. So the PPE used for contact precautions is your fluid resistant or fluid proof gown. Um, your gloves, um, shoe covers possibly depending on the situation, um, a mask because that's uh, not, not a mask like for breathing but the mask that covers so you don't get your mucous membranes contaminated. And then the third one is your droplet precautions. So when we're talking about droplet precautions, these are your large particles. So these are ones that are transmitted when you cough and sneeze and those kinds of things. Um, this is also considered within three feet of the patient. So um, you should have a standard surgical mask on anytime you're within three feet of the patient. Oftentimes contact and droplet will be used together um, just because it, depending on what their situation is. Um, these don't stay suspended in the air because they are larger, so that's why that three feet um, comes into play. Versus with airborne, it's anytime you're within that environment because they just kind of float in the air because they're smaller. So using a regular mask, um, using your other PPE like your um, gown and gloves if needed. Um, remember, you need to take, with all of these precautions, make sure your PPE is removed before you leave the room. And usually there should be a trash can right at the door inside the room, not outside the room, where you can don that, um, doff that PPE and take it off appropriately. So this is a lot of your respiratory infections that fall under droplet precautions and meningitis. That bacterial meningitis falls under droplet. And you can think of it as a bacterial, I mean, a, I'm sorry, a respiratory infection because that's how it's transmitted and oftentimes meningitis starts as a respiratory infection so that's how you can kind of remember that one falls in there because it often starts as a respiratory infection. So the last one we'll talk about which is non-specific as far as what type of um, materials you use is your protective environment isolation. You'll hear it called protective isolation. You'll hear it called reverse isolation. They both mean the same thing. The difference in this is where you are protecting that patient. It's not where you're keeping from getting something from them. So your patients that are immunocompromised, for instance, will often be on reverse isolation. Like in the skin lecture, I talked about patients with burns are often on reverse isolation because you have degraded their number one barrier to infection. So these are patients that can easily get infections. They're, and what um, you're doing with them is going to depend on what you're using. Um, with these types of patients, more is better. Um, it is not wrong to go ahead and use your airborne masks and your masks and your gowns and your gloves and your and all that stuff because these are patients that are highly, highly at risk for infection. Um, some other things that kind of go into that reverse isolation that could be um, sources of infection, live plants, flowers, um, Fresh fruit oftentimes should be avoided. Uh, cooked is fine, but fresh fruit should be avoided. Undercooked meat should be avoided um, because of the potential. Like to us, we have an immune system that if there is a little bit of bacteria 
even if it's occurring naturally in the environment, on that apple you eat, we can fight it. They can't. Um, so when they leave the room, just like other precautions, they should be wearing a mask. Um, and it's all going to depend on what you're doing with the patient to determine what types of garb you're going to be wearing as far as your precautions. So this last one I wanted to show you just because I'm sure you've thought about, um, this is not so much that you need to know, but it's good to understand how we do emergency care in pediatrics. So as you know, everything we do in pediatrics is weight-based. Well, when you have an emergency situation, you can't always get a weight on them. If they are coding or if they are in severe distress, your weight can't be your priority. So, And I will show this to you in class when we meet. Um, this is called a Braslow tape. So what you do with this Braslow tape is you extend it out next to the patient, just like they're showing in um, the picture. You start at the head, you put the top at their head, and then wherever their feet occur, you see it's color-coded along the edges. At that color coding, it tells you everything you need. It tells you the drug dosage that you dosages you need for that size of patient. It tells you sizes of equipment like IV sizes, intubation sizes, Foley sizes. It tells you everything and depending on what hospital you work at will depend on how they have it organized as you see in this case some places have it an individual bag. So if you're this patient for instance it looks like from the picture she ends at the red area you would grab the red bag and everything in that bag would be exactly what you need for that size of patient. Um, some places, especially your pediatric ERs, will actually have an entirely separate pediatric cart where each drawer is color-coded and you open that drawer. If you open the red drawer, everything for the size of patient that would be in that red area fits and is the perfect size for that patient. Unfortunately, um, we have some issues nowadays with using the Braslow tape. Um, just like our adult population, our pediatric population is getting bigger and bigger, meaning they are getting fatter and fatter. So this is a length-based tape. As you can see, it's based on height. It's not based on weight. So if you have a child who is very obese, that length-based tape may not be accurate to in comparison to what their weight is and what you would actually use, it, especially with drug dosaging. So these, this would take some kind of thought process depending on looking at the patient, how you would adjust that. But that is becoming more of a problem and making this be less accurate is because of our increased obesity. So I will show you this tape in class. It's really just interesting to see how we do, since everything has to be weight-based or based on a number, because kids vary so greatly. There's no standard anything in pediatrics. Um, it's good to see how in emergency situations when you can't get that weight, how we calculate that. But make sure you go back and review those two chapters in your ATI book. Chapter 34 goes over immunizations. Chapter 35 goes over communicable disease. Um, you will need to know those chapters, so I recommend you review them.